Good morning, Trinity. We are so glad that each and every one of you are here. We know it's not an accident that you're here. God specifically brought you here for such a time as this. And I just hope that you really um, hear his word and he speaks to you today. My name is Jeff Smith. I'm one of the elders here and also the treasurer. And it's my privilege to give you the morning's announcements. Um, one of the things we like to do to, in order to sort of keep track of what's going on out there with all of you is, is to connect. And we do that through a connect card. So there's either a paper version in the pew in front of you, or um, if you click on the QR code, you can get to an online digital version. But we just ask that you would uh, fill that out. Let us know that you've been here. Also let us know if there is some sort of uh, a prayer request that you have, a praise report. It's just your opportunity to be able to communicate with us. So uh, we ask that you do that. In the same way, uh, giving is a really important thing. Giving of your time, your talents, um, and then also of any funds that you might be able to share with us. And so there is a way through that same QR code or through an envelope there in front of you to be able to give uh, as well as, as the Lord leads you. A few announcements for coming up. Uh, one of the great ministries that this church has is Special Journeys. And, and that is for uh, those families that, that have a, a child who has special issues. Um, we love to be able to reach out and partner with you during the morning service, but also about once a month, we have a special Friday night where you as parents can get a little break, go out on a date, go shopping, just have some time to yourself because we know it is a very challenging thing to be able to dedicate so much time to somebody like that. And so this Friday night is a special Journeys Parents Night Out from 5.30 to 7.30. So if you would like to take uh, opportun that opportunity, we do ask that you would register so that we know that, that's, um, that you'll be there. And, to do that by Wednesday. Also, if you would like to participate in that ministry, let us know as well. We're always looking for people to help. Uh, October 6th, Sunday, October 6th, child dedications. That's always a fun thing too, is, as we just dedicate those children to the Lord. And uh, if you would like to participate in that, we also ask that you would um, reach out and sign up. You can do that through the Connect card. You can call the office, whatever. But um, if you would like to participate in October 6th, that would be wonderful. Um, and finally, uh, we are embarking upon a capital campaign, a capital campaign to really address the re uh, remaining mortgage on this beautiful facility that we have. And there's a lot of activities going as we spin this up. And uh, we just would invite each of you to participate in that. You'll get more information on that. But we do have a newsletter that goes out. You can get at that either online, digitally. You can sign up for that through the weekly email. Or in the back, there's a little table that has a paper version and a QR code that you can sign up with as well. So um, lots of different ways to get involved, and you would definitely will be hearing more about that too. But again, I want to welcome each and every one of you. And if you'd like to stand, uh, let's worship. Well, so great to be worshiping with you all this morning. Now, we know the Lord is in this place. Well, let's just acknowledge his presence as we sing this morning. He is so good to us. He has given us so many reasons to praise his name. Let's agree together.
our hearts and our lives. What a beautiful thing it is to acknowledge that this morning. Well, church, as we continue with our worship service, I want to read Psalm 44, verse 8 for us. So let's see on the screen here. It says, In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. And church, I love that verse for a couple reasons. But, you know, in the English language, we really have one or two words for praise, right? Praise, or in this version, give thanks, right? But in the original Hebrew, there are seven different words for praise. So you'll see on the next slide here, it says tauda, right? It's kind of a crazy word, tauda. I'm sorry, yada is this one. There's, that is one I just said. <laughs> different word. Oh, funny. Anyways, this one means to extend the hand in agreement, right? To wave the hand in agreement. And church, you might be thinking, why are we talking about this? Like, what, what does this mean for our worship service? Well, we're going to introduce a new song today. And the chorus says, so I throw up my hands and lift up a song of praise, right? Church, that song is right out of Psalm 44. What I want us to grasp is that anytime we introduce something new, we want it to be rooted in Scripture, right? Anytime we can just bring it back to the Word of God. So as we continue to sing, let's just reflect on Psalm 44, on God's goodness in our hearts. We love you, Lord.
body. Church, would you bow your heads with me as we pray this morning? Father, we agree, Lord, that the sole purpose of this service, of this church building, and of us gathering together is that you would be lifted high. Lord, we pray not only as we come and hear this message and worship together, but Lord, when we disperse and be the living church out, Lord, in our world, would we continue just to lift your name high, Lord, in everything that we do, every word that is said, we'd be a great example of the God we serve. It's in your wonderful, powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Well, kids here, you guys are welcome to head to Kids Church. Um, we're so glad that you are, all of you are here to worship with us this morning. How's it going? <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for worshiping with us in person and online. Um, truly a benefit of sitting in the front row is that we get to hear um, just the awesome voices of the gathered body of Christ singing, Christ be magnified. And that, and that is just um, an encouraging thing to be able to be worshiping together in that way. Um, we're in our third week of our series called Visionary Priorities, where we talk about these three priorities that, that will help set the direction for where we go as Trinity Church to fulfill our mission, which is to glorify God by loving Him and all people through obedience to His Word. And our first week was talking about focused disciple-making of the next generation. And the second week was, was biblical growth and depth at every age and stage of discipleship. So we talked about this idea that, that, that the next generation is imperative to reach, not only for, for their sake, but for ours as well, as we impart God's Word to the next generation as they are growing up in the church, also looking to, to, to reach the next generation outside of the walls of Trinity Church and biblical growth and depth at every age and stage of discipleship. L last week, we talked about this idea of the trellis and the vine. And we talked about how the structures of the church are the trellis. And, and they are important and vital in terms of encouragement and gospel discipleship. But the vine growth happens through God's people sharing their faith and encouraging one another in discipleship. And that's how the growth really happens. And today's third priority is gospel engagement here, near, and far. And, and maybe you're looking at this and maybe you're wondering um, about the wording of this priority. Gospel engagement here, near, and far. Maybe you're thinking, um, this sounds a lot like missions. This sounds a lot like outreach. How come you don't actually use those words missions or outreach? Well, well there's intentionality in the words here. And, and the definition of engage the definition of engage is to participate or be involved in something or to occupy, attract, or involve someone's attention or interest. To engage in something is to be actively involved and focused on what you're doing. So what is gospel engagement? In practice, it is missions, outreach, and evangelism, but it goes farther than just going on a trip or doing outreach. Gospel engagement is inserting the gospel in every sphere of our lives. It's having the gospel be a part of our everyday lives and, and mission trips we take across the globe to share the message of salvation. It's not wrong to use the word mission or outreach or evangelism, though I want us to see in addition to going somewhere, we can engage others with the gospel where we are right now. And, and today we're going to look at two seminal passages from Jesus regarding gospel engagement in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, or 18 through 20, and Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. And from those, we're, we're going to identify five core truths of gospel engagement and, and our role in that gospel engagement. The first reality, or the first truth about gospel engagement is that gospel engagement is response to what Christ has done for us. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 is known as the Great Commission, and it comes on the heels of Jesus dying on the cross and rising on the third day 
for our sins. Jesus' disciples come to him where he told them to meet him, and we read these words. And Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now we know verses 19 and 20 very well. Go and make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. Um, These verses are plastered on walls and websites of churches and missions organizations, which is fantastic, and they are amazing words. But the underpinnings of verses 19 and 20 is verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. The go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations is possible only because everything is under the dominion and the authority of King Jesus. There is no place on earth, there is no place in the universe that that is outside of the jurisdiction of Christ. And he proved that by dying on the cross and rising again on the third day. Sharing the gospel then according to the Great Commission, according to the, to, to the logic of Jesus' words, is a response to who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And, and we just sang it, didn't we? We just sang, Christ be magnified. Christ, let his praises arise. Christ be magnified in our lives. And that's exactly what gospel engagement is. That's exactly what missions and outreach and evangelism is. They are all a response to who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Otherwise, we would have no reason to share the gospel. It is because of what Christ has done and is because he has all authority in heaven and on earth. We share the gospel not to earn favor with God or with others and not to try to win some kind of argument. We share the gospel because we have been changed by the gospel. And that leads to our second reason or second truth, which is gospel engagement is a command. Not only is evangelism a response to Christ, but it's a command from Christ. What we don't see in the English translation of the Greek text of Matthew 28 is that the command in the Great Commission is not to go. The command is to make disciples. In the English, it says, go, therefore, it sounds like a command. But in the Greek, go is a participle with the force meaning as you are going. So what Jesus is saying is as you are going and the command is make disciples. The command comes right after Jesus saying to go. As you are going, make disciples. People will go. They will go abroad. They will live in foreign countries to make disciples. But the command from Christ is to make disciples. And I think we talk about that a lot when it comes to the Great Commission. But have you ever stopped to think about that? Have you ever stopped to think about the idea that making disciples is a command from Christ? Like we know the Ten Commandments. And we know those clearly. Things like, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not worship idols, you shall honor your father and mother. We understand those as commandments for us, but but when it comes to sharing the gospel, do we treat that as a command from Christ? Or do we kind of look at it as a mm, suggestion? Jesus saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If you feel like it, I encourage you to maybe, possibly, Tell somebody about me at some point when you get around to it. Do we treat it like that? Or or do we look at it as the king who rose from the dead saying, everything is under my dominion, under my authority, under my power. And because of that, make disciples. It's a command. And, and, And as his followers, we are to engage in making disciples, sharing the gospel. And yes, we will go. But we must remember that the command is not the going. The command is making disciples as we are going. Which leads into our third 
gospel engagement truth this morning, which is that gospel engagement is a lifestyle. The key thrust of Matthew 28 is to make disciples, and going, like we talked about, is part of that. As we are going, we are to make disciples, but Jesus' command is to share the gospel. Now, what that means for us today, in a positive way, is that we can make disciples wherever we are. We get to share the good news of Jesus Christ wherever you are. You don't have to go on a mission trip. You don't have to raise support to do it. You don't have to write support letters. You don't have to go to a foreign country to do it. You can share the gospel wherever you are. In your cubicle, at your school, on the court or on the field or the rink, wherever you are, you can share the gospel. And that's the beauty of Jesus' command. As you are going, make disciples. But to put it another way, though, maybe in the negative for us, that also means there is no excuse for believers to not share the gospel. There's no excuse. Like, I don't have the funds to go to Africa. I don't have, I don't have, the, I don't have the PTO to go to Asia on a mission trip. I can't share the gospel. That's not what Jesus is saying here. <laughs> the command is not to go. The command is, as you are going, make disciples. If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ this morning, his command to you and to me is to make disciples, to be his witnesses to the world through word and through deed. Now, some here may feel the call. Maybe you have felt the call and you responded to that call. Maybe some of you are feeling that right now, that call to maybe sell your possessions, sell your house, and to move to a foreign country to share the good news of Christ with others. That is a high calling. That is a high calling from our Lord and Savior. Others here may feel called to stay where you are and to be a light to those at work, school, play, and at home. And that is a high calling from our Lord and Savior. We are all missionaries where we are because we are all commanded to make disciples. There is no SEAL team of disciple making. There's no like SEAL team of like, these are the elite disciple makers and we all just kind of are plebeians who are down here. And that's an important distinction made because, because we kind of laugh about that. But the temptation, either consciously or subconsciously, is for us to think of missions, outreach, or evangelism kind of like the Marines, the few, the proud, the missionaries. Those are the ones who make disciples. But here's the truth we must understand as believers. Missions, outreach, and evangelism are not spectator sports done by a few and cheered on by many. They are an all-hands-on-deck mission where every believer is mission critical. If you're, if you're in the military, or if you were in the military, you understand that, that when you have a mission that needs to be carried out, it is all hands on deck by everybody in your troop or your battalion or, or your squadron. Everybody on that mission has a role and a purpose, and they will do everything they can to make that mission a success. I'm a huge World War II history buff, and if you know anything about the D-Day invasion at Normandy, you know that all hands on deck was a understatement for that invasion. Their objective at Normandy was to storm the beaches, storm and take the beachhead to begin the vanquishing of the evils of Nazism. But for that objective to be achieved, everyone had to be involved. Every person had to be involved. And the one thing that soldiers talk about post D-Day in books or interviews is that they had their job to do. They had their job, their assignment, their orders. They had their role that, that, that they were skilled and trained in. But once they did their duty on the beaches, or some of them didn't even get to do their job because, because something happened or, or some kind of um, turn of events happened in the invasion where they couldn't even do their role anymore, what they did was they just found a way to help. They, they, they found a way to help their brothers in arms. They found a way to continue to advance the mission because they believed in the mission to push back evil and to liberate those who were in bondage. 
when they arrived at the beaches, they were looking out for the mission and for their brothers. They weren't just sitting around thinking, I'm going to stand over here and I'm going to cheer you on as you do the mission. Now contrast that with what many of us, myself included, will be doing in about an hour or so. We'll be sitting on our couch, thousands of people will be gathered at U.S. Bank Stadium, and we, will, and we will watch 22 men play the game of football. Now, we won't do anything. We will not be engaging in football stuff. We will be watching with food or beverage. People at U.S. Bank Stadium will be in their seats, but they will not be engaging in the game of football. They will watch these players play. They will feel the emotions they feel, the joys, the tribulations, the roller coaster rides of a football game, but they will be doing nothing. I will be doing nothing to advance the ball down the field for the Vikings, which is probably a good thing. But when you think of these two scenarios, a military mission and watching a football game, the work of sharing the gospel is much more like the military mission but sadly, in many churches, it looks a lot more like watching a football game. Where we just are on the sidelines and we're watching the few people doing the work of sharing the gospel. Now, I want to be clear. There are some people who, who have been called out by God to go and to, and to sell their possessions, to live across the world, to share the gospel with those who haven't heard it. And that does look different, right? They raise support for their salaries, and many of us here don't. They, they live in a foreign land, while many of us don't. They have a different looking job than the normal nine-to-five jobs that many of us have. Some people have the natural gift of evangelism. I, I know a pastor in the area, and he has the most natural way of sharing the gospel. It is like a fluent language for him. I mean, he'll just be at a restaurant and it'll just kind of come out. And he's just talking about Jesus, asking someone if they'd like to accept Christ as their Savior. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's something that, that I wish I had to have that fluency of just of, of, of evangelism. But those realities don't give us the option to sit on the stands and watch. Going back to that football analogy. We look at the football players on our TVs, and, and they look kind of small, but, but, but when you see them in person, they're massive. I mean, they're huge. I mean, they're building their whole life to play football, and, and, and on a certain level, we can't really relate to them, right? I mean, they make more money in one year than what most of us will make in a lifetime. They have more money than they know what to do with. Um, at least in my case, they are more ripped and muscular than I will ever be in my lifetime. And, and, and so I look at some of these players, I'm like, I can't really relate to you. Like, like, like the emotions is maybe the only level I can relate to you with. Everything else feels like a different stratosphere of worlds that we live in. And the temptation for us as believers is to look at the missionaries, to go to a commissioning service and be like, yes, you go overseas, you share the gospel. It's a great service, and we're praying for them, and we are praying for them. We're supporting them with prayers and, and finances. And then the service is done, and we say, that was nice. That, that, that was nice. What's, what, what's for dinner? <laughs> and, and on a certain level, we look at ourselves and missionaries on different planes. But the reality is, we all have the same foundation as followers of Jesus. And that foundation is that we are changed by the gospel. And that in every time, in every place, all throughout world history, every follower of Jesus is on the same level that are sinners saved by grace who want to share the good news of Jesus. Nobody is better than the other. We are all saved by grace, wanting to share the message of Christ, to be salt and light wherever we are, because we live in a world that is perishing. And we have the message of hope that Jesus brings life and is the only way to salvation. That brings us to the next truth of gospel engagement. And that is that gospel engagement has eternal implications. 
The reason why evangelism and engaging the gospel in every sphere of life is mission critical is because eternity is at stake. Every day when you go to work, when you're at school, when you're at the gym, when you're in your neighborhood, and even at church, you will come in contact with people who are perishing spiritually. They don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when their life on earth comes to an end, their eternity begins and it will be separated from God in conscious torment in hell. This is not because God is mean. This is not because God is vengeful or lacking in love, but it's because we are all sinners. And we have chosen the lot of sin. We we have sinned against a perfect, holy, and righteous God. And because of that, we all face eternal wrath and judgment for our sins. But as we were dead in our sins, completely unable to make ourselves right before God, as we were dead in our sins and facing an eternity separated from God, Jesus, the Son of God, was sent by the Father to live a perfect life and to die on the cross for our sin. Not only did Jesus experience the greatest physical and excruciating pain and humiliation one could face in Roman crucifixion, but Jesus on the cross experienced the deafening silence of God. Jesus experienced the deafening silence of being made sin. The sin of all humanity, your sin and my sin, was put on Christ. And the full cup of wrath from God was poured out on his son. The one who had eternal communion with the Father was now on the cross completely isolated, alone. When Christ cried from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was in that moment that God the Father who had eternal communion with his son had turned his back on his son because his son had become sin on the cross. And he did that for you and for me. Christ became a curse for us. And for the next few days, the world held its breath as Christ laid in the tomb. But on the third day, Christ rose from the dead as he, as he had predicted. And Christ now sits alive in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And what Christ does for us now is that he intercedes on our behalf for those who ask him for salvation, who confess their sin to him. When you put your faith in Christ, Understand what happens. When you put your faith in Christ and ask for the forgiveness of your sin, what the Father once saw in us as a person who is unrighteous and sinful, when you come to Christ for salvation, he now sees righteousness and perfection because Jesus is standing in our place. And so the Father sees perfection and holiness and righteousness from his Son. It's what we call imputed righteousness. That Christ takes his perfect record and he puts it on us when we come and confess our sins to him and ask him to be our savior. But this eternal conscious life in Christ only comes through Jesus. There is no other way to salvation. Some of you may have heard recently Pope Francis. He said, quote, all religions are a path to God. There's only one God and each of us has a language to arrive at God. Some are Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, and they all have different paths to God, end quote. Friends, that's that's not the gospel. That is false teaching. It's not true. Jesus himself in John 14, 6 said, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. 
I mean, it's as clear as day. There is only one way to salvation, and Jesus is it. And we have the message of salvation from the one who actually died for our sins and lives again. Buddha is still dead. Muhammad is still dead. Gandhi is still dead. Joseph Smith from the Mormon faith, still dead. Jesus is alive. And we have the gospel message, and we, sh- we want to share that to a perishing world. And maybe you're here this morning, and maybe you have never heard the message of the gospel, that we are sinners and that we are in need of a Savior. This morning, if that's you, I invite you to confess your sin to Christ, to admit that you're a sinner because we are all sinners, and to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Paul says if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. If that is you this morning, my prayer is that you would call on the name of Jesus. It is that simple to say I'm a sinner and Jesus, I need you to be the Lord of my life. That is my prayer for you this morning. And if you say that prayer in your heart, and you chose life in Christ, I invite you to tell somebody, tell me, tell one of our elders, tell somebody here at Trinity because we want to celebrate with you this new life. And we want to walk with you in this new life. But friends, we have the message of salvation. And it's not like Gnosticism where it's the secret knowledge that that, that only the elites can know and nobody else can know. This is a message that is for all people. Paul says it in the book of Romans when he writes this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. With the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him if, in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him on whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. There are people all around you in your neighborhoods and workplaces and schools who etern- whose eternities are set toward death. We worship the God who gave us new life and the gospel has eternal implications. And my challenge to you, believer, this morning is don't stand or don't sit on the sidelines waiting for someone else to do it. You hear Paul's words in Romans 10. How are they to hear if nobody comes to them? There are people in your life who may have never heard the gospel before. We live in this technological age where where information's at our fingertips. There may be someone who's never heard the true gospel, and you could be the person who brings it to them. Don't sit on the sidelines and wait for someone else to do it. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to share the gospel. You don't have to have a graduate degree to share the gospel. All you need to do, read the Bible and share about God's plan for salvation and share about how God has changed your life. That's it. And lead people to Christ. You are not the Savior. It is not your job to bring someone into new life. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Our job is to prepare the table and let the Holy Spirit do his work. And it's because the gospel has these these eternal implications that we come to our last truth, which is that gospel engagement has no borders. We see throughout history stories of of people who forsake everything, who, who sell their possessions, who forsake wealth and fame, to go and move across the globe to share the gospel with people who haven't heard. They see how the gospel has changed them and and they want others to know and so they go and and they make disciples of all nations. 
In the last recorded words of Christ's time on earth, we see him open the disciples' eyes to the reality of the gospel not having borders, not having limitations. In Acts chapter 1, we read this. So when they, meaning the disciples, had come together, they asked him, they asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So in this account, you see the disciples are still focused on the earthly kingdom. We see in in verse 6, they say, Jesus, I mean, after Jesus rose from the dead, he told them everything he was going to do. He does it. He comes to them. And the disciples' first question is, okay, Jesus, is now the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Like, okay, I know know the death and resurrection thing. That was kind of a sidetrack. But now is the time that the kingdom is going to come, right? To which we see Jesus' loving response to them saying, it's none of your business. None of your business. It's not for you to know the times of the Father, that that the Father has appointed. It's none of your business. But he doesn't leave them just saying, sit down and be quiet. But he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's a good reminder to us today as believers to remember our job is not We are not on the planning committee for Christ's return. We are on the welcoming committee. So some of us may need to spend more time telling people about Jesus' return than planning for Jesus' return. Jesus calls us to be ready, to be watchful, but we are not to watch at the expense of sharing the good news. It's a good reminder to all of us. But, but notice the paradigm shift in Acts chapter 1. The disciples were going down the track of Jesus bringing in this earthly kingdom to Israel, but Jesus redirects them and gives them a vision for the gospel going forth to the nations, starting with them in Jerusalem. And how do we see that fulfilled in the book of Acts? Well, in Acts chapter 2, we see Pentecost take place. We see the nations converging in Jerusalem and the Holy Spirit coming in miraculous ways and the gospel is shared in Jerusalem. And then we see throughout the book of Acts, the disciples are scattered across the ancient world and that may look like a bad thing until you realize that the gospel is sent forth to the nations. The gospel is is introduced to Africa through through, through the Ethiopian eunuch. When Philip shares the gospel with him, he brings it back to Ethiopia. The gospel goes north, south, east, west, and the gospel goes to all the nations. And we as believers today, because God's word is living and active, Acts 1.8 applies to us today. That we are witnesses where we are today. And it's helpful for us to understand that that all of us are beneficiaries of the disciples spreading the gospel outside of Israel. We are all the beneficiaries of the gospel not having limitations, not having borders, being spread to the nations. And it's because God's word is living and active that we are called and commanded to be witnesses of Christ here in Lakeville and in Dakota County, in Minnesota, in our country, and on social media, we should add, and in the world. Though the command in the Great Commission is to make disciples, we should still be compelled to tell the world about Christ because our life has been changed by the gospel. Some of you may be feeling the call to go out in the mission field, and I pray that you would respond in obedience to Christ. Because our world needs Jesus. But friends, it starts here with us. 
I remember when, when I worked in youth ministry, I, I took sophomores in high school down um, as, as a part of a leadership team. I took sophomores down to the south side of Chicago, and, 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 we, and we went on a mission trip, and, and it was an awesome time. It, it was a really incredible time of, of sharing the gospel in word and deed, but, but really coming to grips and face-to-face with a different reality other than ours, and, and being able to serve alongside ministries on the south side. And, and that following year, um, uh, um, the, 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 the church I was at had a, had a fall retreat, and, and, and a pastor from the south side came up to be the speaker, and, and, and he was awesome. His, his name was Pastor Jay, and, and Pastor Jay talked about Acts 1-8, and I still remember what he said. He talked about this whole idea of, of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And he looked at all of these few hundred high schoolers. And he knew that a fourth of them would come down to his area to help with a mission trip later that year. But what he said was, he said, I don't want you to come down to the south side unless you are sharing the gospel with your friends at school. And he said, we don't need help picking up trash if you're not sharing the gospel with your friends. And his whole point was saying, it's so easy for us to go somewhere else and to share the gospel with people we may never, we may never, never see again. But how are we doing sharing the gospel with our friends, with our family, with our coworkers? And that's where it starts for us. And that's why gospel engagement is a lifestyle. As we share the gospel continually with our kids, with each other, with our coworkers, we will be compelled by Christ to go across the world and to share the gospel boldly because we are not ashamed of the gospel, because the, because the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. And this priority, this gospel engagement priority is, is one of our three priorities because we believe that the gospel is the power of God. Trinity was formed as an outreach for youth back in the 40s. We've talked about this before. In our history is an outreach for youth in the south of the river. And Trinity began to grow and grow and grow. And Trinity has continued to be, um, have a high emphasis on missions. But this is one of our priorities because it's a good reminder for us that, that missions is overseas and it's right where we are today. And our desire is that we want people from Chanhassen to China to hear the good news of the gospel. And God uses his people to make that happen. And like Paul asks in Romans chapter 10, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Friends, if you're a believer today, you are mission critical to the advancement of the kingdom of God and for God using you for someone's eternal zip code to be changed. Will you step up? Will you engage in this mission to share the gospel here, near, and far? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. And God, thank you that, 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 that your word makes it abundantly clear what it means to be saved. To confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And God, I thank you that you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sin that we may have eternal life. God, I thank you that the gospel is the power of God for the salvation for all who believe. That there is no distinction, there's no economic or, 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 or racial or ethnic divides, but the gospel is for all people who come to the name of and the person of Christ for salvation. And God, this message is so important for us to share because we live in a world that is perishing. And God, I pray that you would ignite a fire in our hearts 
to share this news with others. Not from a place of being better or more elite than somebody, but being one beggar telling another beggar where the food is. To tell them where salvation comes from, and it is only through Christ. Jesus, would you raise up some people here to be courageous. Raise up every body, every person in this body to share the gospel. Lord, we thank you for the message of salvation. May we be a body that engages the gospel at home, in our city, in our county, in our state, in our nation, and in the world. Because the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Well, church, let's stand and respond with a hymn, a simple hymn, just with our prayer being the whole would cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let's sing together.
Lord, as a, as a gathered church this morning, we acknowledge your holiness, and Lord, in an attitude of reverence. Lord, we just acknowledge that together. And Lord, like Pastor Jason mentioned, would we, we, would we be stirred in action to our neighbors at home and abroad and have a lifestyle of worship, a lifestyle of missions, and just gospel engagement, Lord, near and far. Um, and we, Spirit, we need your help as we do so. We just are proclaiming that we need your help. And in your powerful name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, church, thank you for worshiping together this morning. It's great to be here this Sunday. I want to remind you of our prayer team that would love to pray with you. And hey, on your way out, um, maybe find someone you haven't met yet and just greet them. So let's go and be the living church.